You have to be a chameleon. Could you come do this big band thing, sight reading? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, right off the bat, when I say that, there's not many that I know where I live, you know, could say that. Now, when I do these dance band gigs, I could call 50 people. I'm able to fit in.
Yeah. That was great, man. Thank you. Uh, earlier this week, we uh, for any of you who tuned in on the episode of The Drum Department with Frank, we had you playing on uh, a kitchen setup, uh, what was it, an ironing rack. <laughs> I could have used <laughs> the iron today for the yeah. shirt. Bunch of different stuff. So uh, we gave you a, a drum kit today so you could Thank actually you. play some drums. So. And it's fun playing with all these cymbals and drums. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Love it. Now, for any of you who aren't familiar, we're here with Frank Bellucci. And you've got quite the resume. And you've been doing something that uh, I think a lot of drummers want to do for their, their living and their career. And you play drums full time in New York. And lastly, we do this kind of stuff inside of Drumio all the time. Uh, we've got a method that teaches you how to play the drums. We've got a bunch of exclusive stuff coming out with Frank in the next year or so and onwards. Um, and we also have 5,000 drumless songs and transcriptions of all your favorite songs up there. So if you want to check that out, you can go to drumio.com forward slash trial and you can see everything that we're up to there. Frank, we're talking about can you make a living playing drums? And this is the perfect topic. And I'm so glad you're here to talk about this because I'm sure we could be here for 12 hours yep. discussing all the ins and outs. But we're going to try to scratch the surface of this and uh, play some music, talk about some stuff. So I guess to start off, what's the secret? Can you make a living playing drums? It's um, no kidding. It's a lot tougher now with these days um, for many reasons. You know, there's so many uh, people looking to play and get bands together and play gigs. Like I said, in, in 1976, when I graduated, and, you know, I was 18. And, well, I, I was actually 17 when I graduated. Then I turned 18 in November. Then I went my way. And I wasn't even legal to go on the road or be in the bars, but my cousin was the older one, so he would, you know, say, all right, I'll keep an eye on him. Yeah. But the, in, in before that, my cousin, that's why I always looked up to him. He was, that was his job. It wasn't like, Oh, I play on the weekend and then I go to my the other job during the day. So growing up, my cousins, that was I that's how I knew them. They're in bands playing, that's their living, going all over the place, raising a family, you know? And in those days, you know, it's like uh one, you know, one was at least could stay home to take mm. care of the kids, you know, and not have to worry. Like now you need four incomes you know, in a family <laughs> yeah. to survive. But that was his living. So all I was, and he would say to my parents, you know, when he gets of age, you know, I'm going to see what we could do here. And that's what happened. And so I didn't go on to school, college, when most of my friends did. And it was because that's going to be my job. Mm. It was no question because as soon as I got in this band, you did not play less than five nights a week. His deal with was with the agent at least five nights a week and all year round. Mm. Then there were gigs we would get. They had to be six nighters. Like we went to Florida for four months. Those were like six nighters. Some gigs in Manhattan at the time were seven nights. Wow. So you just went all the time, you know? So he would have to, and it wasn't things where, and I still don't do that, where, oh, there's a wedding coming up. We have to go to our family wedding. It wasn't even about that. Yeah. You were working. And it wasn't about subs, where now you have to get subs to do mm. other gigs. That was your job. Yeah. And, you know, and just no different than a regular job. So it was a beautiful thing. So 18, 19, 20, through my 20s, then when I left his band, I got in another situation like that. We went right to St. Thomas for four months. So I was at gigs where you went to, you know, Italy doing the corporate things. And again, then what, it, what was cool about that too, then as my mid-20s, it was the club date scene. I know some calls them casuals, but that was like the wedding and the, all the private gigs. Mm. So I got in one of those bands. And in those days, you did Friday, two Saturday weddings, two Sunday weddings. So if you had five uh, gigs like that on a weekend that were nice money gigs, you were able to do, I was able to go to the bitter end on Monday, do an original thing where you didn't have to worry so much, you know, how much I could do my original projects and stuff and keep the midweek thing going, take my jazz gigs during the week. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was always like that. Now I have to do almost twice as many things, mm. you know, and the biggest thing that I think for me, one thing is I say to this, my students too, you have to be a chameleon. Look, if you have one style of playing, 
And I only wish you get in a band that becomes famous. You know, you're writing songs, good for you, you know, great. Uh, but, you know, how many in a million get that? Yeah. So in order to do this, being a chameleon meaning that I couldn't turn down work, and I knew that. So if I got a call, hey, Frank, uh, and, you know, could you come do this big band thing, sight reading? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, right off the bat, when I say that, there's not many that I know where I live, you know, could say that. Yeah. So already that puts me in a little different thing. I tell you, I do a lot of these restaurant jazz gigs on a snare, a hi-hat, and that little, you saw that video, yes, whatever, yeah. little 14-inch bass drum I put on the side yeah. because I'm here and the tables are there. So the last thing you want to do is, you know, be playing where now they go to they complain, you're not there anymore. Yeah. So in order to work, being able to play really low and adapt to that jazz thing, there's gigs I don't pick up sticks. It's just brushes. So there's not many I could, like when I left here, I had to sub that gig out. Yeah. There's not many I could call. Now, when I do these dance band gigs, I could call 50 people. Yeah. You know, I right, learned this disco tune, learn this song, and, you know, maybe endings and, and uh, beginnings, they might not, but, or a blues gig, you could, you know what I mean? Yeah. But the thing for me, not if I, as I keep talking, is the adaptability of whether it's a sight reading gig, a big band gig, a, a funk gig where you have to read, a session. You know, now I have my little studio at home, that's really helped mm. because people hide, like the songs I played today, you know, um, you do your tracks and then you send them. Yeah. So that's helped me too. The point, have, you have to have all these little things. My teaching, mm -hmm. one little, my gigs, the little studio things I do, um, some of the clinics, I wish there were more. It was, uh, you know, it, 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 I, hopefully they will be. Yeah. I have to get this together, you know, the book. <laughs> so that would be something. But it's all the little things. It's not just one thing where it's just a gig. So, but the adaptability, if you want to do this, that's what I find, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm able to fit in. Yeah, so coming back to that idea of being a chameleon, um, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, like, what types of styles, what types of, um, what are the grooves that you need to know doing what you do that actually pay the bills? Yeah, well, if, now here's another thing. There's something else about being a chameleon. Like when I first learned club dates, you know, you had to have the bossa nova, you know, and they would give you, like, in the, the, the old style club dates, they don't want any, anything hip. So if we were doing like, a, you know. Uh, I just went blank, the uh, okay. merengue. Yeah. Right. Um, so you, these different, of course, the swing beat, the wall. The pokers. I mean, these were like the regular beats you had to do. But now, like, I'll play with certain bands, and everybody has, like, certain names. Like, I love when they say Latin. <laughs> what, what is that? What does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> Under that, I, I mean, there's a, how many? So, but I always ask, and this is something drummers always ask. Don't be afraid to ask, especially if you're filling in. If someone says to me, look, it's kind of like a... Uh, a six A with a, and I go, you know what? Just hum me, mm. you know, give me what you're hearing. Well, it's a, like a sango with a, a twist. Tell me what it is. Yeah, what's if the you melody? Could, if you could, you know, and then I don't care what name you call it. Yeah. You know, well, it's like a 12 8 oldies, okay. Hip hoppy, you know, they'll tell you that. So they want more, you know, like that. Oh yeah, that's cool. You know, a little funky. Oh yeah, okay, that's it. So you ask because some people come up with names yeah. that I have no idea what it means. Yeah. But, um, it, and it's just being aware on stage. I talked to Vinny the best about this. What you can't learn in the basement is reflex. Mm. What I mean by that, look, there's times you want to, you know, you want to dig, you want to, you know, meanwhile, you know, the, the leader's screaming at you, looking at you. Yeah. So I've learned, because I've had friends that have had that where they can't stop, you know, they close their, now, musicians do that to me, which drives me crazy. Mm. You know, guitar players looking down, look at, I'm the drummer, so I'm aware of, I tell you, I play with that 11-piece band. I'm back here. I could get into my own head and play my beat. I'm looking at you. Yeah. I'm looking at the keyboard player already in it. That one over there, I'm looking at the guitar player. We have a guitar, vocals here, bass player. I'm like this, playing the whole gig. 
you know, and then making cues, calling cues, being aware. Yeah. And that a lot of people are it. They get in their own world, and the ones that look down with the pedals <laughs> keep fixing this and this, and you're like, you want to take the stick and throw yeah. it. <laughs> Have you ever Which done I, that? Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> but the great thing about drums, you know, if you go, oh, man, I'm sweating. Stick came right out. Yeah. Meanwhile, it's right in the guy's like this. <laughs> it was an accident. <laughs> it's in the back of the head. <laughs> it slipped. Yeah. But, um... It's, there's a lot of things that go beyond just playing the drums to work. Mm -hmm. You can't just get in your own head, you know? And I've done like these jams and drummers come up and I talked about this. You guys, everybody knows Grayson. Mm -hmm. So Grayson was 14 and he would, his parents would take him to all my jazz gigs on Sunday. We were doing an open jazz thing with the great piano player, great bass player. Uh, who's with was with Ahmad Jamal, who passed mm. away recently. So we would swing, and it was great. So Grayson would come with his parents, and even though I'm lefty, I'm always, you know, go ahead, go play. And I would switch the drums around for him mm. all the time. And we talked about that with him yeah. in Quebec. And look what, you know, what happened. So that was a, 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 at least something that he was able to do and get his feet wet with that. And then from that, it started building and look what it's become, right? Mm. Um, but it's, yeah, yeah, it's that thing of being the chameleon reflexes on stage and instinct mm. because I could, I'll be playing and I know already if someone calls the next tune, I know that that person there and that person there doesn't know yeah. what the next song is. Yeah. Well, this one is doesn't have his patch out yet. Mm. So I'll I'll be like, oh, you know, let me keep playing. I go, I'll play, I'll play. And because they start counting it in, this is this one's on a different song. Mm. This was that you just know it. And you could feel things where when I'm filling in or something, if something changes on the spot, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you think, all right, the song's coming to an end, but you know, like, okay. No, it's not coming to an end, yeah. you know? So you, you and see, horn players, <laughs> can I keep that? Yeah, don't get me started now. <laughs> because a lot of them, they're locked into the charts, right? Okay, so they're seeing eight bar intro, then the verse comes up, blah, blah, blah. Well, if the eight bar intro, if the some part didn't happen yet or the singer didn't come in yet, you know, let's keep going, extend it, you know? All right, and now when you hear the vote, but they'll be counting their measures. Mm. Next thing you know, they're playing the horn line and they're in the wrong section because yeah. they didn't just get their head out of the book, look up and realize this one didn't start right. It's, it came in wrong. So it's those things. You know, and these could be great musicians, but sometimes you can't be in your own world. Yeah. And uh, these are all little, being on time, so I could keep talking about that. Yeah, actually, before we get into that, because there's this is great discussion, I want to do another track. You do? Yeah. Let's do another track and then we'll come back. All right. I'm going to get a drink of water here. Yeah. So, so this this next one we're going to do is called Bill's Bop. Yes. My and great who, friend, Billy Heller. Okay. And and who else played on this track? They were all with Billy Heller on piano and he wrote them. He's nice. with the Rippingtons. And Jim Kamak on bass. Uh, two different sax plays. Eric, I think, is on two of them. Nice. The five in that. And if uh, I'll have to look... And Jeff Kashua, another great sax player. He might have been on the first one we played. Got it. But I mentioned them. And yeah, Eric Marathon, as you know, with yeah. the electric band. and um, That's awesome. But yeah, so which one is this, Ed? This is uh, Bill's Bop. Bill's Bop, Billy Hella. Let's do it. Yep. Let's see if I remember it. <laughs> Thank you.
Awesome, man. It's great. Thanks. Yeah. Some people were saying that reminds them of uh, some like Pixar music. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which probably a lot of the guys played on, anyways. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about um, so playing 300 gigs a year. There's, there's a lot of moving pieces with that, of course. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with the scheduling, the equipment? I'm sure you've got kits in different places. You've got a car full, multiple bags packed all at the same time. What, how do you even manage that? Yeah, well, that's why I go with a real small kit, depending what it is. Um, it's, and I don't, I wish I had somebody making the calls or taking the calls. I don't. So far, it's worked out, you know, but I'm, you know, I'm still, people laugh. I don't put anything in my phone with schedules. I need wow. the paper. I have to have, <laughs> I'm the old school. I want to see it written down. I do have like schedule books, like all over the place where yeah. sometimes I go, wait a minute, I better check. Because sometimes I have it upstairs, one. And then downstairs in my studio, if someone calls now, I put it there and I go, oh, wait a minute. Which book is it in? Yeah, so a lot of times if I'm on a gig and someone's texting me, could you do this gig? I go, yeah, please give me a couple hours when I get home. Yeah. So um, it's, I've been, yes, it's in my truck are two, all the time, trap cases. The light hardware of, you know, DW and then the regular hardware bag. Mm. Uh, I keep, I do keep, uh, extra snare in there. I have my extra pedals, drum heads like we were talking about. So you can't even, I guess if, when my family, if we even go out and they go, oh, uh, you want to drive? I go, oh, that means I got to lift the seat up. <laughs> and my seats are never up in the back. So it's always, um, it's always ready to go. I don't keep like the symbols and stuff that, you know, hopefully no one takes. Mm. But yes, it is. And um, like I'll say, okay, like before I came here, I know I'm going to a nice little jazz gig on Thursday when I get home. Mm. That little drum's in there. I had to take out my bigger drum because I did a gig with the 20-inch drum. Yeah. And, it, and what happens, sometimes what you forget, that's why I keep all the hardware from different bass drums in there. Oh, nice. Because you take this tom from that kit and you go, oh, wait a minute. I don't have that mount. Yeah. So now I always have extra snare stands, so I've used that too. Yeah. But now what I do is all the different drums I use, I put the mounts in the truck. Mm. So I know if that bass drum's in there, I just got to remember the right tom. Yeah. So, you know, that's that drum set. This tom goes with it. That's that. And uh, so it's it's that. And then I have done, like this one band, they do bring drums for me. A few of the places now on Long Island have house kits. My buddy makes uh, ruckus drums, which are unbelievable. Nice. And he, he, they, there's a couple of the big venues have the house kit there. Mm. So one of them, actually my buddy Pete, gave them symbols. So everybody laughs, because I go there, I go, I'm using his symbols. Yeah. I'm using that snare drum. I even use the pedal. So there's times Perfect. I walk in with a stick bag, which is unusual. Yeah, the I know, dream. <laughs> yeah, I know other drummers are like, oh, I bring my own stuff. I go, that's because you're young. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you that's not going to happen. But, and the set is great. The symbols are great, you know. what? I'm, and sometimes, but I also, I mentioned yesterday, you know, the extra seat because that could be bad. Mm. Um, I have, thank God, friends and students where if it's getting close to, I'm doing a, the early gig and the second gig, I'm like, you see the traffic report, you know, or you're looking at it for you like, uh-oh, yeah. how am I getting there? So I've had a call, students or friends that go, could you bring, go to my house to get this drum set and bring it to this gig? Mm -hmm. Or could you come to where I am so as soon as I hit the last cymbal crash, I'm out. Yeah. And just take them and just bring them, you know, to my house or leave them in your car and I'll, you know, you can drop them off. That's happened. Other times when you see like, all right, I'm an, I'm an hour away and then it goes to an hour and a half away and two hours away, I go, that's it. So yeah. I've called friends. Could you go to the gig and sit in for the first few tunes? Yeah. And yeah, no man, don't worry about it. You know, so you do what you, it's, I've been lucky, knock on wood, mm that it's always worked yeah. pretty much, but uh, the traffic will get you. Mm -hmm. And changing times, which drives me nuts. People will give me gigs. I go, great, 11 a.m. to two. The next gig is 3.15 or 3.30, great. The next gig is 7.38, great. Yeah. Then you get the guy. By the way, they want us to start at one, you know, and I'm on my first gig. 
Yeah, what do you do? And you go, <laughs> that's a great thing. Could you let me know a little later? Yeah. So that's happened, or they call you the day before. They go, man, sorry. It happened to me uh, coming up a Sunday. Mm. I had it all set. What time we start? Six. I go, great, I'm done at four out east. Calls me back. No, they want us to start at two. I go, that's it. And so I had to give that up. Yeah. So did things like that happen. But you, uh, so it's, you just, uh, again, I, I have to take everything. And I will say this about, that's why I do get frustrated when I see, you know, some that are out there playing and I know, you know, they're either playing for free or they do it when they want to do it. Mm. I never had that chance. Meaning, you could ask my wife, if, if it's Monday and I see, wow, I don't have a Friday this week. It's not like I go to, okay, we're going out to eat or we're going to do something. Yeah. She knows that already. Because Thursday will come and I get a call. Yeah. No matter what plans we had, she knows already. <laughs> I'm taking, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where these other guys, oh, no, I can't go. I'm, we're, we're going out to dinner and stuff. Or we're going to, great. But then you take gigs when you feel like doing it. You know, mm. so when my mom died, I played. When my dad died, I played. They actually waited a few days where we could actually have the funeral and wait. We had a day off. And you know why the reason with that? Because when my mom died, my father looks at me and goes, what are you going to do? Go out and play. There's nothing that's going to change, right? Mm. You do it so that, and then my dad, I could hear him when he died. Like, what are you, not just go out and play. I think it's, it's, it's a common thread you see with musicians in general, all instrumentalists and uh, artists. And I mean, what we do takes a toll on our physical health, uh, our time, like mental. there's all the yep. mental health, like yep. the sacrifices you have to make to do what you love. That's I right. Think that appears in different musicians' lives in different ways. And it's amazing to hear the stories of how people make it work. And That's right. And it is, you know, and, and you have to have whoever your partner is or whatever that is, it's an understanding because I've seen situations where they've met each other from the gig or on, yeah. at a certain place and that's fine. All of a sudden, they get married. Well, you can't do that anymore. You know, they're, they're, yeah. they're just like, well, wait a minute. You met me like that. <laughs> like, I go to my wife. You met me in the place I was playing. Yeah. In it wasn't like I was a doctor. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to just play drums now. For yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's some great questions that came in. But before we do that, I'd love to do a bit of a drum solo. Oh, yeah. you put me on the spot yeah, now. Yeah, man. I, I said we might do it. And I'm, I'm feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happens.
Now that's a drum solo right there. <laughs> that was awesome, man. Ooh. I feel like I've uh, I just watched the whole movie. Yeah. <laughs> whole soundtrack right well, there. Well, you try to, you know, that's you create from the different styles. Yeah. You know? And I always say to myself, you don't need to be a master. Like, for instance, listening to Brazilian music, samba. Mm. Yes, I know a samba. I know a bossa nova. Go to Brazil and you know what you don't know. <laughs> exactly. You'll see what you don't know. Because they would like just, you know, you don't even pick up a drum. Yeah. And it's the same with the Afro-Cuban stuff. Mm. You know enough to at least enjoy it and get what you get for the drums. Yeah. But to say that's, oh, yeah, I know that, I know. You have to live it. Yeah. It has to be in your blood. But I always said that, understand it, listen to it. Mm. Then you put it in your tool bag, yeah. you know? And then when you have to create, you're not creating just from exactly. one thing. You're creating, you know, and especially with the swing and shuffles, that gives you a different feel. And then all of a sudden, maybe you're getting a Latin kind of yeah. vibe, you know, or the foot pattern thing. So uh, yeah, that's you, the way you, you create. Like, even if you can pick out like one, two or three elements of whatever style of music, like if you're not growing up in Brazil, you're not experiencing 20, 30, 40 years of culture. There so it is. They grow up and they're already with the... Uh, the Pandero, they, yeah. they'll, they'll scare you just with that. But it doesn't mean there's not something you can grab. That's there, right. So. And you, like when I took lessons with the late great Afro, uh, Afro-Cuban, he has the Afro-Cuban book, Malibu? Frankie Malaby. Yeah. And he would laugh because, you know, we'd be in a lesson and he would go, Bellucci, how do you write this out? Because he wasn't really <laughs> transcribing. Yeah. So he would play something. Of course, I wrote it as either an eighth note or 60 note. And I play it back, he'd go, no, 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 you know. And he would say, it's got to be in the crack. I go, well, I don't know how to write it. It's yeah. in the crack. <laughs> I understand you got to, that's what you got to feel. And even with those books, yeah. you have to understand, like, even like any kind of thing like that, it's written as eighth notes or sixteenths. How do you swing it? Because like even the, you know, like the 50s rock, all these drummers came from swing and big mm. band. So they weren't playing. It, always had, it wasn't a shuffle. But I always say, you got to be able to, if I'm playing... Yeah. <laughs> and that's that's always the classic debate where drummers will say, uh, I never want to learn jazz because I'm a rock drummer, or they come from uh, jazz and they don't want to learn how to play rock because they're a jazz drummer. But when you go back in time, rock didn't exist at one point. So that's where all your favorite drummers came from. That's right. So And all those records, you hear that, you know, even though the 50s, it was, you know, what they, whatever, rock, it was those drummers, they were swingers. Yeah. They swung, you know? So now they just put that, instead of that ding, 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 yeah. just straighten it out a little bit. It still has that shuffle, that, that yeah. nice, you know, swing it. feel. There's a, we're actually running pretty low on time, but there is, I want to answer at least one question. This is from a drumming student, uh, Fourfold. They're asking, where do you look for drum auditions for gigs? Or where would you recommend nowadays? Obviously, you have a huge network from... 40 years of doing it. Right, right. But where would you recommend people start to look? I say, but it's a lot, a lot of it now is, we used to have, and again, it was a lot more difficult because we would call, we would get what was called the village voice in the day mm. from Manhattan. And it had the ads in the back, audition, audition. I don't know, I think online, more. a lot of my students do that. There's some kind of, I'm not good with that. There's some kind of online, you know, thing you could probably look up mm. uh, for, for at least in your area, maybe. Yeah. Drum auditions. I always say this, create your own. Here's what happens. When I, very young, when we wanted to learn jazz standards, I would invite friends over my house. They had what was called as the real book, yeah. which has all the jazz standards, right? So I would get my own and let's do page this, let's try. So we were learning these on the spot together. Yeah. So now how many times, you know, you played them through your life. But what happens is, let's say one of my friends says, Hey, I'm going to invite my friend, such and such, to come over. You mind play sax? No. Now, all of a sudden, you connect with that person. So he'll go, hey, man, by the way, are you available to sub? Yeah, okay. Now, from one person bringing one person, he, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That was a connection. Now it's a web. <laughs> I go to the gig. Now, that band or somebody, the bass player, goes, hey, man, great. Could you have... 
So if you start and you put your own little thing together, get a, if you play drums, get a bass player. Stop, start, I love the simple trios. Mm. One reason, because you only have to make two calls. <laughs> yes. These bands, I'm in a band like 10, 11 people. Yeah. About time, and then they do group text and I'm out. I always say create. Because my, my students go, man, there's no bands, there's no bands. I go, you have a basement? Or now you get a, rent, a studio, so easy. Call a bass player, guitar player, learn a few songs. Yeah. And see where that goes. Now, you may not hook likes, but from that, you get a number. So it's, it's, it's good to try to create your own situation. Well, we're, uh, we're almost at the end, Frank. And this has been great. Great discussion. I'm watching all the chats in the members area and on YouTube. And yeah, great I hope I discussion. get to see some of these. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to go back and see it. Yeah. Frank, before we, before we close out, we're going to close out with a track called 541. 541, yeah. It's um, in five. It's a Billy song again. Yeah. One and, thing... Uh, Oh, sorry, one thing we haven't talked about, which I think is super cool. Vinny Kaliuta is a good friend of yours. Yes. And uh, that's, I don't think there's a lot of people I know who are good friends with Vinny. But um, can you tell us like one of your favorite Vinny stories? I said it before, but the, and it, this is in 1987. I was at the NAM show in Anaheim, 87. I was young. Um, and playing the NAM show, whatever it was, it's the end of the day and Kim's with me. She wasn't my wife because it was 87, yeah. but we would go to the NAMM show together. And it was the end of the day, the show would close like at six, but everybody be milling around. Mm -hmm. So she, there was a popcorn stand. Kim goes, I'm going to get popcorn. I go, all right. I go in the corner. I don't know why there was a snare drum. It wasn't at a drum booth. It was at like some piano booth, but there, someone must have put a snare drum in the corner with a pad. You remember the Gladstone pads, like the plant, the rubber with the, yeah. in the middle, had the raised bit, yeah. So I have my sticks, of course, so I go, you know what? So I was really, you know, into the mole with Jim Chapin, you know? Jim was a great friend of mine, and, you know, took many lessons with him. So I'm doing this on the pad, and I get a tap on the shoulder. I turn around, he's like, hey, man, that's, uh, you're doing the, that mole, that's, that's pretty good there. And, you know, he, I look up, and I'm not, you know, I'm going, all right. I'm thinking I'm on candid camera or something. Yeah. So I can't say what I said to him, but we laughed because I blurted out like, a, <laughs> I go to him, are you kidding me? You? He goes, no, man. You know, so so Kim, we, there was no phones. Okay. She would bring those throwaway cameras to take yeah. pictures. I call, I go, you got to come here. You got to get this because she looked at my face like I saw, you know, yeah. who, who knows what I saw. So she takes the picture. I still have it. Oh, he goodness. had the long hair. I had the long hair. And... He had to go sign autographs at Zildjian. Now, it's the end of the day. Yeah. But typical, you know, Vinny's going to walk over there. He goes to me, come on, man, I have to go over there. And I'm going, let's go. We're going, Kim. All right. Yeah. And we walk over, and he, like, he, I had written an article in some local drum magazine, and he read it. I was goofing on club dates and, you know, whatever, being, like, you know, with the leaders and dealing with whatever. And he goes, yeah, that was a funny thing. And then we go over to the booth, and I'm standing, and he just like, and I'm ready to go, like, all right, you know, I, I, I'm sure that's it. He goes, so he's like this with his arm around, and he's signing autographs. <laughs> I'm standing like a little kid yeah. right there, like, I'm Collier. not going to leave. <laughs> I'm not going to leave, and the line's coming, the line's coming, he was talking. So from that day on, you know, I mean, through the years, you know, it's not that we always, but then we uh, we stepped, kept in touch, and then um, some years later when he was doing that, 10 Summoners tour, mm -hmm. called me up. I brought Kim, my brother, to Jones Beach yeah. and went back there to see him. And then we would, what I love is we would always, he would like leave the bus or whatever. And if they were staying, I would just take him, he, we go eat. Yeah. So I got to see him with Sting a few times, uh, Jeff Beck a few times, and. Um, Are they Herbie? And Herbie yeah. a bunch of times. And the last one, Herbie, he played on Long Island. Mm. This is already a few, but that's probably the last time I saw Vinny. And then my buddy, who's a drummer, was a student of mine, owns a nice restaurant, the homestead there. And Vinny loves the Galamad, so we take <laughs> him there. So about three times, he's been at the restaurant. He came to my house when he was in town with Sting, when my daughter was born. She's one week old, and there's a picture of him holding her. Oh, but wow. here's a great picture. <laughs> it's like one, two, or three in the morning, whatever it was, that we're making macaroni at the house. Yeah. And it was snowing or something. And... You know, you get the macaroni, you have to strain it. Mm -hmm. So he takes it. I got a picture of him with the gloves on, the strain the macaroni, <laughs> with sticks in his pocket. It's the best. <laughs> it's legendary. Yeah. So uh, we just did a FaceTime last week. Nice. When I see him call, because you never know when you're going to hear from me. He's all over the place. But um, 
My wife goes, it was 11.30. She goes, uh-oh, Vinny's calling. I go, all right, I'll see you in about an hour. Yeah. <laughs> I go downstairs and Gotta we're on this. It. We don't even talk drums. We talk food, laughing, life. You know, that's what you, you do, like you, with yeah. any friend. But sometimes I even say, you know, to myself, man, I'm, this is Vinny. You know, and I even, I, he laughs when I go, because I have some friends, like Al, Al Miller's son, Matt Miller, is mm. he, so, uh, can I tell a quick yeah, story? go for it. We go to Jeff Beck, I take Matt with me, so he's so pleased. So of course, after the gig, we're gonna go to uh, Chinatown in Manhattan to eat. I get Vinny in the car, so Matt goes to me, I promise, I'm not gonna like annoy him with stuff, you know, I won't, blah, blah, blah. And, and Vinny had known Matt's father, Al, mm. and you know, knew of Matt. So I go, you know, don't worry. So I'm driving, Vinny gets in the car, I kid you not. After Matt finishes through that whole thing, don't worry, I'm not gonna do oh, no. Within 15 seconds, you know, you're the leaning over the yeah. seat. Da, da. Vin, that when you were playing that, the, <laughs> to this day, when I bring that up to Matt, he's on the floor. He goes, I couldn't help myself. Yeah. So Vinny turned around to him and started, you know, talking, and then we yeah. ate. But uh, I know, like, uh, I brought him to the restaurant. I invite, like, my close friends that I know are yeah. not gonna scotch him, as we yeah. say. And he was cool. We actually celebrated his birthday a few years back at mm. my friend's place. And uh, he was cool because they're, they're all cool. They know enough, you know, they all respect him. Yeah. But uh, they're not going to start, hey, man, you know, the last thing is, what did you play on that, Dave? What did yeah. you do on that? <laughs> but yeah, so uh, he's, uh, he's, 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 to me, he's the best. I, I've seen them all. I know he's my buddy, but yeah. he's, before he was my buddy, you know, it just, what he sight reads, his mind, yeah. what he plays, the adaptability. Mm. Adaptability. He, it, it, it's just amazing yeah. what he goes into. You know, and plays. Yeah. That's so cool, man. It sounds like we've got to do uh, cooking with Vinny and Frank here on And Drumio. we got to get my buddy Vito Reza, uh, Reza <laughs> in Toronto. Yes. Because he, uh, yeah, him and Vinny too. And we, sometimes we do the three-way and we laugh. Nice. Vito is a riot and an unbelievable cook. Yeah. So we should do a cooking show. We talked about it. We definitely should. Let us know uh, in the chat or if you're watching this on YouTube, if you would watch cooking with uh, Vinny Caliuta and Frank <laughs> I think I would watch it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for coming out. This is a blast, and there's going to be a lot more stuff uh, coming from Frank throughout the year and even into next year. And I guess we're going to close with... Can I say a thanks? Yes, of course. Uh, and in this business, it's tough. Like I said, I've... And a lot of times you get down, I do, because the age is going, age is going. And now with the internet, I'm not good with it. I Hopefully I will and get the book going. Instagram, like my daughter said, I have to start doing that because I know that's the big part of it now. Mm. And... So having, when someone gives you an opportunity or a chance, there's not many. A lot of people talk like that on social media, like they're, you know, they got your back or they're, they're so good for lack of a better way. Well, uh, 20 years ago, 20 something years, Wayne Blanchard from Sabian actually went to Ralph and said, you know, get this guy at the Montreal Drum Fest. Mm. No one knew who I was. And Ralph took his word for it. That's the, so they go, you have like 28 minutes. And I did it. I opened the whole day, like 11 in yeah. the morning. Then Ralph, you know, the connection, the next year I did it. Then years went by and Ralph called me for this last one, Quebec. Mm -hmm. So that's unbelievable. Started with Wayne and then Ralph gave me a chance. Now with Quebec, I got to meet these beautiful men here. Yeah. And here I am. And I, had, we, I touched base and then we did a little Zoom meeting. So I say this and of course, it uh, does my heart good. Thank you. Well. You're uh, always welcome at Drumio. I and hope to be back. Ever, ever since uh, the drum festival in Quebec, we're like, we gotta have this guy out. Well, I, and Not I thank Not just for the him. jokes either. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I didn't have really good jokes. Maybe the playing was more of a joke, but yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank awesome. you. awesome. You're always welcome. And uh, I'm stoked to hear this last track. This is Oh, Jesus, five, I forgot. I thought I was 541. The yeah, here we go. Awesome. It's in five, so I better be able to count this thing. It's been a while since I played it. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Uh, Thank you.